early meeting where we began today, June 15, 1991, in Santee Town Hall, well, Hawks Restaurant at Santee, South Carolina, about 35 minutes later than usual. We're happy to have all of you here, and at this time to get ourselves in tune, we'd like to bow our heads while the invocation is given by the Reverend Isaac Jenkins. <coughs> Reverend Jenkins.
reception, whatever, and something happened on that. But anyway, the town of Fairfax received a refund there of two hundred dollars. What she have done? I received a check on uh, this week, one day of this week, in the amount of four hundred dollars, and that was she paid two hundred dollars <laughs> over. So I did. I have a check in. I spoke to the president a while ago about it. I'm going best to refund her the two hundred dollars instead of holding it for the next two years or whatever. And also, if you see down here on the town of Porto, I have a balance on the reception. Now that balance on the reception is the 1919 reception. The reason why it wasn't given at our last meeting because the A&P store have made it fail, but they sent the bill out late, and then it showed up naturally on our report in the office. And um, <coughs> the way things are going in Port Royal now, I don't want any problem with them. And to show up on the audit because everything is itemized. And we do have a balance there of 4158, which that is a spoken president for it to be paid also. So if you have any other questions, I'll be glad to answer. Mayor Robinson. Mayor Holmes. On, on these expenditure, are these, are these outstanding? Uh, have they, been, uh, they all have been paid. On the yes. Okay, now I noticed in your income here, the town of Alabama sent $200. Now that I don't do, I don't see it. Okay, that was on the other report that I presented last month, okay. I mean last quarter. Okay. See, these, these reports that came in, the income here came in after I had the report, but it did, was on the uh, report of that, uh, that report. Are there any other questions from the mayors? Hearing none, I suppose you were prepared for a motion to set by minutes. Madam President, off the motion that the uh, trade report was received as information. I second that motion. The body will be second that the minutes from our previous quarter meeting <coughs> is, uh, I'm sorry, the treasury reports be adopted. Are you ready for the question? Motion. All in favor? Aye. Ask aye. Aye. Oh, his name? Ayes have it so ordered. Thanks for the report and it shall be placed on our files for future references. Thank you. Mayor Robinson. As far as the uh, treasury report, during our annual conference, I would have an annual report, which is not hard to do with staff, because everything be part of the treasury report, and I'll have everything itemized, just like it's going now, whatever. And that's what it be, we'll have a copy of that. And I'll be glad to see your copy for uh, that report. Thank I'll you. Give it to the again. <laughs> Thank you. Again, <coughs> And. Uh, Mayors, do you feel you had ample time for your minutes and you prepared? If so, we'd like to ask to entertain a motion at this time for the approval of the minutes from our previous quarterly meeting. Madam President, I offer the motion that the minutes from our previous quarterly meeting be uh, accepted. I second that motion. Question? Question. Question. Excuse me, Madam President, I have some corrections. Yeah, I have one too. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I should not have asked you to approve it. Because we <coughs> have one, two, three. I'm thinking we have a whole body. And it just hit me. We do not have the whole body for our minutes and we need to hold on till the others come in. If not, we may have to hold this one until our next meeting. We, we, uh, we still had two corrections, Madam President, if I may note. Back to the financial. No, that I meant. Two minutes, okay. Um, the fifth paragraph where they're talking about your personal notes, I believe we said we were right. Um, I guess the four days is correct. They did not have to respond in writing. This was just so, because I think it says here that they have to respond in writing and tell you why they couldn't come. We just was trying to generate a greater attendance at our conference. So they didn't have to respond in writing. It was just a, a courtesy call to them to try to um, institute better attendance. Mm -hmm. And on the back sheet, very top paragraph, I do not believe the Legislative Black Caucus sponsored the uh, reception. I think that was another group. So I think we need to so note that change. For a minute? Yes, ma'am. Mayor, are you following me? Um, just Are you following? You want to erect that, Mayor? Mm -hmm. Mayor Robinson took the minutes, acting second.
secretary at our last meeting. So we were giving her time to find that. It just so happens that um, Ms. Hepp, that I had on my little note, legislative caucus, black caucus, and then I had reception there. So that's why I put it in there. But, <laughs> but if you didn't, I'll be glad to, uh, okay. to find out the group. Right. And uh, I'd like to say, too, I'll start taking these minutes almost at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize for all those things. <laughs> no, that was just no. Okay. As all the mayors, though, the directions on your own. And on your minutes. And what did you say about the president writing the question about the personal note? Oh, that was fine, but they didn't, I think they're supposed to respond in writing. It was, we did not stipulate that they had to respond back to her in writing. That was just a courtesy call. Oh, okay. Have you checked that up in minutes, um, Mary? I'm going to just let our minutes at the moment be a point of information, but I would like the, the other mayors are here for approval of other minutes, please. Hopefully, we will do this a little later in the meeting if we have others. But I count about seven of us that we have out of about 20, so. Am I counting correctly? I count seven of us. Well, I got seven. Did you count me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Always. I was going to count seven. Seven. I don't know. I need somebody. Seven. Someone. I just know I counted seven names. Thank you very much. So we'll wait for the quorum. Thanks for the uh, Miss Coordinator, Miss Hampton. Miss Hampton, thank you for the corrections on our minutes. We appreciate that very much. We shall proceed. We are going to move down from the conference coordinators report as you see listed on your agenda. And I think at this point we are going to um, omit that and the old and new business and go down to presentation. Um, reason being, we do have our presenters here and we don't know the schedule of these people and certainly we want to acknowledge um, having with us our senator this morning and give him an opportunity knowing that everybody here are busy people and you have taken time out of your busy schedule to be present with us and we certainly would like for you to hear the presenters and of course certainly we would like the senator as he is in his district to to us this morning. So if the black the legislative black caucus, but I don't know exactly where we are now. So since he's with us and Matthew, certainly we're happy to be in the district here and in Satie. And I must put this blow not to present him or introduce, <coughs> but I want to say Senator Matthews has been second to none. He is a fine senator. We've been happy to have him work with us and for us. And today there's another in our presence today. I don't believe that would grace us or have this blessing other than our great Senator, <laughs> Senator John Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I look at the names, his name is William Robinson, and I look at Henry Robinson here. I said, that, that can't be the same person. It might have to be William Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he was recently elected, and uh, he's doing a good job. And, uh, I, I, and I hope that you would invite him. At least I will inform him about the uh, black mayor, and I'm not too sure he was he's familiar with it. Oh, yes. Um, we sent him something. He said he had a, a previous engagement he had committed to, but I told him if he could arrive late, fellowship with us as we dine, and we'd be happy to have him. Okay. But I, I'm gonna I can assure you that he's going to be the kind of fellow that's going to work with you. He's energetic. He's the kind of go-getter. He's a no-nonsense kind of person, but sometimes you need to get things done. Uh, in essence, um, William has talked to me about some things that need to be done in terms of the community. But the same problem that we have in our community is probably the same problem that you have in yours. That is trying as individual elected officials to improve the quality of life of those people we represent. And to do that, uh, I think a couple of things that we got to look at, how can we do that? And one of the things that we often talk about in terms of mayors and things of our need is basically infrastructure. And you really got to have infrastructure as the first component to be able to be competitive, <coughs> to, to, to track industry and track business for your community. And those monies and infrastructure from the state is concerned is to somewhat get love at time. There's some money out there for jobs and there's some jobs creation. There's not a whole lot. But there is still some out there. And those people who are go-getters can get some. And, and, but it's a competitive process, but some funds are available. The second thing I think you might be interested in that uh, real portion is beginning to shake up representation for different sections in different communities. And uh, we cannot say at this point who will be representing who by this time next year. Uh, primarily because uh, we are on a point that we have not formalized that process, and we don't know whether we're going to be able to uh, go to court or whether we're going to pass it. But there is a force within the General Assembly who's bent on going to court. Uh, there's another force who believes that we get, will have our best opportunity by going through the Justice Department, and that's the legislative by caucus position. And that is also what we call the statewide coalition position. And let's let me tell you where we are about six, seven months ago. We formed what we consider to be a statewide coalition made up of about six legislative black caucus members. We had some uh, members from the NAACP. We got some members from the black churches and black elected officials uh, and formed this coalition. It is chaired by Herb Shielding and co-chaired by Bishop James. Uh, Dr. Gibson is the uh, chairman of the Citizen Input Committee. I serve as chairman of the Strategy Committee, which is responsible for coming up with some basic reapportionment plans. To do that, we need to raise about $25,000. And let me tell you why that's important. Because you cannot go through reapportionment anymore without computer technology. That technology, as a minimum, costs about $25,000. So we have bought that technology. And we have housed it at Allen University. Uh, we figure that once we get through with it, then Allen will have some good computer capabilities that can help educate those students there. Uh, but the other example that is needed, that most of your counties and some of your cities will have to go through reapportionment. There are only four places in the state that you can go. And that is either to the Senate, the House, the Governor's Office, or to Allen. And in case you need a second opinion, or somebody to draw up some reinforcement plans for you, that can give you some clear, objective information where you can sit down and talk to, that can be done now at Allen University. And as long as those computers are there, because we've got the database for the state. And we think that will help you somewhere down the line. The other thing I simply want to mention to you that uh, as we go through this process, I hope you kind of contact with your local delegation, kind of figure out where you are, because there will be some major shifts. The basic change on real portion is that the population growth in the state is coming from the coastal counties, pushing up. And when that happens, it's pushing everybody kind of from the coast, pushing up towards the Piedmont. And uh, we believe that we will create a couple of new house districts and a couple of new senator districts, but they will be on the coastal areas. And once you do that, since you only have 46 senate seats, create two or three with nobody in, that you got to put two or three people out of the Senate. And that gets to be kind of personal when you got to decide on <laughs> who's going to be in and who's going to be out. And it, it's, a, it's a tough game. But it will make some significant changes. And those changes will be there for the next 10 years. The other thing that you might be interested in, uh, the Census Bureau has informed us that they are, they are going to make an adjustment in the Census camp. And that adjustment will probably, more than likely, will be in the minority communities. And those will be the communities that you represent. They have informed us that that adjustment will be of somewhere about 5% uh, projected. 5% uh, adjustment in minority counties will have an impact upon your income and where you are. We believe that if we do that adjustment, and like they suggested, it will come down about the 50th of the month. And 
So that adjustment should help you in terms of uh, looking at your town population. So I would suggest somewhere around about 15, you find out whether that adjustment has had an impact on you and your citizens in your town because it will affect your revenue. Finally, let, let me say that uh, Mayor Gruden has been here for a long time. He has his council folks, people with him. And Santee is a growing community. And I think through the skills and the help that you can offer to him and offer each other, it will make all of us better off. Because I think we got to learn to lean on each other, and learn from each other, learn from our mistakes. And, learn, and once we can do that and share, I think we, you know, it makes you better mayors, it makes you better community. And again, I want to apologize, Mr. Mayor. I've got three appointments today. I have one at 8 o'clock. This one, I'm going to meet some folks at 11 o'clock. And so I'm not going to be here for the rest of your meeting, but I can assure you that the town of Santee and the community of Santee and the county of Orangeburg will be glad to have you. And we hope that you enjoy it. Spend some money with the mayor, because I know he needs the tax money. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. If you get him into trouble while you're here, call the mayor. He'll take care of you. May I feel you? And I spend hours at night sometimes talking about this reapportionment and what kind of effect it might have on our towns. And I'm sure that you all are probably looking at the same. But seems as if I knew you all would keep the senator out this way if we should lose him <laughs> from the regional Dorchester County area, the portion that we are in. Hopefully that wouldn't happen. But if it does, this is life. And um, we'll just have to learn to work with whoever's there. But I think we'll work hard do our best until that change comes. We did enjoy the remarks from him. We're going to move on with our meeting. And again, following our agenda, under the presentation, we have with us this morning Mr. Cleveland Thomas, Jr., who is the Deputy Director of Rural Development, Governor's Office. This is in Columbia, South Carolina, and we're pleased to have him with us. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. If you don't mind, I'd like to sort of keep my seat. I've got pieces of paper all over the place there, and uh, I don't want to have them thrown all over the floor. As a uh, first up, and I'd like to bring you greetings from Governor Campbell, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the group here. As a brief introduction, uh, I grew up in North, uh, North Charleston, a place called Union Heights. Some of you have heard of it, I'm sure. Uh, went to South Carolina State, retired from the Army as a lieutenant colonel on the morning of the 28th of May, uh, 1988. Um, my first job in the governor's office was as the assistant director in the Office of Small and Minority Business Assistance. At that time, I worked very, very closely with Stefan Edwards. In fact, Stefan uh, was my boss at that time. While in that office, we put together several uh, programs which I'm really proud of, Stefan's proud of, and some of you may have heard of. I'm not patting myself on the back, but uh, the office had been sort of dominant, dominant for several years. In fact, I think mm -hmm. Cheryl could tell you, and uh, over the last three or four years, it's really gotten a shot at the arm. But uh, we, in the Office of Small and Minority Business Assistance, created what's called the Minority Loan Program. We um, <coughs> did much to to give life to the certification program. We had what was called the brain trust meeting, and we did a lot on the procurement side. And I'll talk about those things later on. But just briefly, that's sort of my background prior to becoming the deputy director for uh, rural development. The reason for the change is this, and I know a lot of rumors are flying around out there uh, in terms of what happened, but this is from the horse's mouth. Stefan Edwards the, the decided to run for the vacant board of trustee seat. I think there were three seats at South Carolina State College. In view of the ethics, rules, and regulations, and what have you that's going on now, uh, a month or two prior to deciding to run, the governor's office put out a guideline, a rule that says if you run for certain boards and certain commissions, then you cannot be at certain jobs in the governor's office. The trustee seat at South Carolina State happened to be one of those positions. Therefore, Stefan had to put in, in his resignation. Uh, he did on the 27th of March of 1991. 
I was asked to take the position of rural uh, deputy director rural development. That position was upgraded. Also, the position of uh, the assistant director of small and minority business assistance was upgraded. So that's the bottom line. That's what happened. Whatever you heard on the street, as I said, you got it from the horse's mouth. Take it. That's gospel. Okay. Um, <clears throat> In this position, I I plan to build a lot on what Stefan did. <clears throat> Stefan had a very good program going there, and the old saying, if it ain't fit and it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it what is it? If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I, I really, you know, I'm just going to hold the course. However, there are some things I think we can do to sort of uh, improve on the uh, programs that were put in place. And I'll go through some of the programs that I plan to, to uh, institute in a few minutes. What I would like to do is to get, develop a partnership. That's why I wanted to get on the program. I spoke with Cheryl on a number of occasions. I spoke with you there. And uh, I want to build a partnership. As the Senator indicated, there's not a whole lot of money out there. And the funds that are available, you need to be aware of so you can take advantage of them. There are some funds in the area of community development block grant, which I will cover. There are also funds in some of the federal agencies. I feel in this position, or in rural development, we have for so long depended on the public sector. But in the old job, the job that I had prior to the small minority business assistance, I really capitalized on the uh, private sector. The bankers, McDonald's, Flu Daniels, and folks of that nature. And they weren't reluctant to participate. It was just a matter of going out, soliciting their support, telling them about the program, and convincing them that I did have a viable program. So what I would uh, expect to do in this position, in working with you, is to get the private sector more involved. Just recently, and uh, just last week, I was in Myrtle Beach, at which time I attended uh, South Carolina Rural Development Council. That, count, that meeting took place as a result of an uh, uh, organization that was formed in January of 1990 by President Bush. He put together a rural economic development task force to look into the plight of rural America. There, were, there are seven pilot states, of which South Carolina happens to be one. South Carolina has two representatives on the national task force. I think it's a lady from uh, South Carolina Electric and Gas. She's the PR lady and one other individual. South Carolina has been given a sort of a, a leading role in putting together the program. There are seven, uh, about six initiatives that's been identified for this particular task force. Those are number one, form a presidential council on rural America. Number two, establish state rural development council. The South Carolina Rural Development Council has about 35 members from the private sector, the public sector, uh, the governor's office, uh, small business administration, South Carolina State Development Board, Farmers Home Administration, the Department of Agriculture. It's a multifaceted kind of uh, uh, council. Last week we met at Myrtle Beach for one week, and we were working with strategies and things of that nature. And one of the things that I found in South Carolina that uh, is very, very important in the rural areas, education, viable education programs. I was in Charleston just about a month ago, and I met with representatives from the various islands, about four of the islands. And throughout that meeting, I heard education, education. We need to do more in terms of education. The South Carolina uh, Rural Development Council has spent a lot of time and is spending a lot of time in terms of developing educational initiatives and strategies. And hopefully once this thing is uh, shaken out a little more, I'll be able to come back with you to you <coughs> and let you know <coughs> excuse me 
<coughs> and let you know what's happening there and solicit your input. Another one of the initiatives is uh, to conduct rural development demonstrations. Not a whole lot was said on that, so I can't go into much detail. Uh, another is to expand the Rural Information Center. Uh, I'm not too awfully familiar with that, but I'm still trying to find out. Uh, five is to target federal rural development programs, and six, make the working group a standing, com standing committee of the President's Economic Policy Council. I think what we're seeing here is a uh, step in the direction of dealing with the plight of rural America. As I drive through South Carolina, down around Williamsburg and Georgetown and counties of that nature, I'm, I'm led to believe that the ponderance of South Carolina is rural. And uh, so this is a, hopefully a step in the right direction, and this state will capitalize off of whatever that's, is being formalized at the national level. Now, what Governor's Office of the uh, Department of Economic Development. We have what's called Community Development Block Grant Funds. There are about uh, four programs which I think the rural areas, you in this room, should be able to capitalize on. And what I'll do now, and I have some handouts so you don't have to take copious notes, I'll go through and briefly highlight or summarize those programs that I think you can take advantage of. First is the Governor's Community Revitalization Grant Program. Total funds in that program for FY 1991 is 12 million dollars. That's for the entire state. A letter of intent is required to participate in that program and unfortunately the deadline is the 15th. That's today. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry I wasn't able to, to give this to you prior to now. But don't let that uh, demoralize, okay? Because there are some other programs, I think, that sort of duplicate uh, that particular program. Program description. This program is designed to address specific housing and community development needs of low to moderate income persons. Funds will be awarded to units of local government on a competitive basis. Revitalization funds must be used to carry out an eligible project which addresses at least one of the three national objectives. These are the three national objectives, and these objectives apply to all four programs. Number one, benefit low to moderate income families. Number two, aid in the prevention or elimination of slum or blight. And number three, there must be a threat to the health or welfare of the community. Now what, are the, what is the requirement for this program? Each public facility activity must be designated to provide a minimum of 51% benefit to low to moderate income. And I think this is just typical of community development block grant funds. You've heard this before and you'll hear it throughout. Uh, grant amount, maximum $400,000, a minimum of $150,000. There is a local match requirement, 10% of uh, CDBG funds requested, which means you have to put up 10%. Selection, letter of intent must be submitted to the Division of Economic Development postmark no later than June 15, 1991. Unfortunately, that's today's date. And each regional planning council or call will uh, determine the top four applications in its region. So the, the application would have to go through the call. The second program is the Governor's Livable Communities Grant Program. Total funds in that particular program, $2,400,000. $33,000. There's no deadline, and the applications are processed in the order of receipt. Program description. The 
purpose of the governor's livable communities program is to allow the state flexibility in funding important projects without requiring them to go through competi competition. So it's non-competitive. Example of, examples of projects would include small water and sewer projects, housing development assistance, indoor facilities programs, projects addressing critical needs resulting from disaster or imminent threats to health. Again, there is a uh, requirement 50%, 51% must benefit uh, low to moderate income persons. Grant amount, maximum of $150,000. There's no minimum amount. Local matching requirements, 25% of community development block grant funds. And in terms of selection, applications will be evaluated for funding as received. The third program is called the Governor's Economic Development Assistance Grant Program. Total funds in that program, $10 million. Program description. This program provides assistance to units of local government to carry out activities which will support economic development and opportunities for economic growth, particularly through projects which will create <coughs> new jobs, retain existing employment opportunities, stimulate private investment, and revitalize the growth and diversification of the local economy. A unit of local government may apply at any time for an economic development assistance grant. Now, I'm using that term, and I guess maybe I'm using it loosely, uh, local government. Do you all understand what I'm making reference to? Okay. Let me just sort of summarize. <coughs> In essence, what I'm saying, when you submit an application for one of these grants, that application goes to the uh, goes to the county for processing. It has to go through, and Cheryl, if I'm off track, you might tell me. It goes through the council, uh, goes to the uh, council for government. The, the, well, some of them do, ma'am, and some of them don't. Some go to the uh, county administrator. From the county administrator, it goes to a finance committee of the council, county council. Then after that, it goes to the full council. Then after that, it has to be a two-week two hearing. Okay. And uh, then after the hearing, it's, it's sent back either approved or disapproved. Some of them go to the county administrator, and the county administrator gives it to the cop. So I think it sort of depends on you know, the, the relationship you have with the COG and with the county administrator as to what route it takes. Okay, Cleve, I'm going to back up here and, mm -hmm. and inject one thing. When they say it can be county or it can be a municipality like a town, so for, for those that are dealing with their county, if you're going to do a joint application, then it would have to go through what you're talking about. Um, units of local government can apply directly. Wagner, town of Santee, Ridgeville and M, they can apply directly to. So. Okay. Thank you. She okay. worked up there for quite a I while. I think one of the good programs, though, that we need to look at, and I don't know, the COGS probably talked with you about the upcoming 91 CDBG, what Cleve was talking about, the CR that it, letters of intent were due today. But that livable communities program is something that we should look at. And they don't have any definite guidelines, so you need to think about doing that and, and looking at some projects. It's, it's not a cure-all if you don't get in on the $400,000 cycle, but they can handle up to, I think that minimum, as you said, was $150,000. $150, but for some of your smaller projects, if you want to do housing, you don't have but maybe um, five, six, seven houses to do, you might can do that if you join it with some other funds. If you have a small um, drainage project or some other things, I think that's a project you need to look at. If you have a farmer's home housing development coming in your area and you need to do some additional kinds of things, they took several programs and lumped together in that program so, um, so they could kind of deal with it. So it, if you have, if you think you have an eligible project 
or, or have an idea for a project, write them by all means because I think they're open and will at least tell you whether it plugs in. But I think that's something our our small towns need to, to look at and plead with if, if you can work with us and help us in that. And I think that's one of the projects that we might could take a look at and even pull it out and make it a, 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 a small town project because I think that's a, one of their better categories. To work with it. And uh, I have a lady that, uh, that's done this for quite a while and she's very, very knowledgeable. So just give me a call. If I'm not there, I'll give you a name and telephone number at the end. And we'll be more than willing to come out, sit down, chat with you, talk with you on the telephone. We're at your disposal. Uh, the, again, this is the Governor's Economic Development Assistance Grant Program. The grant amount, maximum of 250000 There's no minimum. Selection criteria, applications will be received in order of receipt, will be considered in order of receipt. And the event funds are not available to fully fund applications under the consideration at the same time preference will be given to those projects involving exports, <coughs> agribusiness, rural locations, and minority of female-owned businesses. And I'll talk more about minority of female-owned businesses later on. The uh, last program is the Planning Assistance Grant Program. Total amount of funds in that program, five, uh, $500,000. This program is designed to provide community development block grant funds to develop the policy, planning, management capacity of CDBG administrators to effectively determine community needs. Requirements. Applications for this assistance are required to use a regional approach to CDBG planning activities. Planning activities must address one of, the, of those national objectives, and I mentioned those earlier. Grant amount maximum of $50,000, there's no minimum. No matching requirements. Selection criteria, only one application will be funded within each of the 10 planning districts of the state. Those are the four programs that are available through the Community Development Block Grant Funds. Now there are some other uh, programs that I'll mention uh, that's related but not directly. One is Job Economic Development Authority, or JETA. JETA is a state agency that's headed up by Elliot Franks, um, and they have the response. They have a revolving loan fund, which provide grants to units of local government to be used to make loans for the following purposes: small business development, infrastructure financing, and basic industrial building. Uh, again, as I said, this is uh, another state agency, and uh, let me see if I can remember off the top of the page to tell you that here, here is seven, nine, seven, three, seven. And if you are interested in that particular program, you might call Elliot Franks at 737-0079. Now, those are the programs that I think, and uh, Cheryl indicated, that you can take advantage of. I've brought uh, about 25 handouts there you might want to read through and uh, see what questions you have. Please feel free to give me a call. I'll be more than willing, as I said, to talk with you about those. And if I don't have the answers, I'll make sure that I get them for you. Uh, let me get into some other areas which are sort of near and dear to my heart. When I took the job in the Office of Small Minority Business Assistance, one of the things the government charged me with was going around trying to determine what were some of the uh, problems facing minority businesses. And I went out and I, at one time, was putting 13, 1,500 miles on the road a month. That's a whole bunch of miles. And I found that invariably financing was a big problem. Getting access to the procurement system was another problem. And training, or a lack of training for minority business persons, another problem. As a result of that, I went back and I addressed each individual. But one that I really emphasized was uh, financing. Because money is hard to get, period. And when you're a minority business person, it's even harder. Uh, 
uh, it's extremely difficult. What I suggested was that we come up with some kind of a minority loan program for minority business. This was in November of 1988. Uh, about a year and a half later, we put in place what's called the minority loan program. We have made uh, loans uh, to business persons. We made one in uh, Bamberg in October of last year. We just made one in uh, Richland County about a month ago, and we've got several working. But let me sort of summarize what that program consists of. Again, I have handouts here uh, you can have in case you've got questions. The purpose of that program is to help economically viable, viable small businesses expand and again to create jobs. The governor's office will stand behind 60% of the loan up to $100,000. An example, you need $100,000, the governor's office stand behind $60,000. There must be participation from a private lender, i.e. bank, savings and loan for the other 40%. In order to be eligible, the business must be certified by the Governor's Office of Small and Minority Business Assistance. Certifi certification consists of filling out an application. Someone comes out to do a site visit, and the purpose of that site visit is to determine whether they're the people who are supposed to own and control the business actually own and control it. We found in a lot of cases with the white females, they would come in and say, I own 51% of the business, but when you go out and you, you try and determine uh, who is doing what to whom, it's the male that answers the questions, it's the, it's the male that has the expertise, it's the male that's worked in that business for 15 years, and the wife, she has got an administrative role. So in order to make it a viable program, we put that certification in place, and it's, it's really working. Um, another uh, Eligibility, the business must have a net worth of uh, less than $1 million. I've seen very few minority businesses in the state with more than a $1 million net worth. So the majority of our businesses qualify under that criteria. Certain businesses are excluded. They are uh, uh, retail businesses, restaurants, and farms. Now, why are these businesses? Uh, excluded because of the fact that traditionally they have been high-risk kinds of businesses. Uh, hopefully at some point in time we can create a program for those kinds of businesses, but so right now we don't. Um, certain areas are excluded. These are entitlement areas. And it's the same with the Community Development Law Grant Program. Those areas are Charleston, North Charleston, Florence, Greenville, Spottenburg, uh, Rock Hill, Aiken, and maybe one other. So I don't think anybody in this room would be affected by that. In order to, um, what I would expect, if you come in and say you're certified, you're qualified, I would expect that you present to me, or the business present to me, what's called a business plan. A uh, business plan just gives a sort of a picture of who, what, when, where, and how. There are a number of agencies who can help you with this. The Small Business Development Center, Cheryl can do it. You've got the Minority Business Development <coughs> Centers, they can do it. You've got a group called SCORE. But that's very, very important. In fact, before you go into, and I'm saying you, I'm just I'm telling you this because you'll be talking to people out in your communities and you can advise, advise them on it. Before you go into a bank, to get a loan or when you go. Uh, I don't care who you are. If you don't have a business plan, then you're not going to walk out there with nothing. They're not going to even talk to us. And uh, so you can save yourself some time, some money, some effort by getting yourself a good business plan. I advise your, your people to get themselves a good business plan before they go out to try and get money. Because I, I have to require it. Um, job creation, again, this is a federal fund, and it's required that for every $10,000 that's borrowed, at least one job be created. And lastly, there is a collateral requirement. The, uh, the 
question would have to have collateral. Now, what are, what am I, you know, trying to get over to you? There are programs. Uh, the well is not dry. There are programs, but I found when I was working on my uh, graduate degree that there are programs out there we haven't even heard. Of. And it's because the system probably don't want us to hear about it. But in this job, I'm going to be upright with you. I'm going to tell you about the programs, how to go about uh, accessing the system. And as the senator said, it's going to left. It's going to be left up to you in terms of the enthusiasm, and the requesting, and things of this nature. You've got to be enthusiastic because some of these communities are very, very uh, aggressive. So why don't you look at the handout that I brought along with me, see whether any of those programs apply, give me a call. Now there are some other uh, possible sources. Farmers Home Administration, and I sat in on a meeting last week, and I spoke with the guy that runs that program for the state, and he said, hey, I've got money, come on in. I've talked to some people who did not receive a warm reception. That's what I'm here to do, to find out whether the rhetoric that they're talking out there is just rhetoric or are you know, they going to be left. Another uh, agency is DHEC. I understand that DHEC has some kind of a, a program for water and sewer. I understand the Budget and Control Board has some kind of a program for water and sewer. So these are some additional uh, sources. I know that there is uh, someone else scheduled to come after me. I'll stick around throughout the lunch hour to uh, answer whatever questions you might have. If I can't answer the questions, I'll get your telephone number and get back with you. My number in Columbia is 734-0562. Feel free to give me a call if I'm not there. Leave a message. I'd like to return my calls. In fact, I think it's very, very impolite to, not to return a call. So if you call, uh, I'm going to get back with you. For the last two weeks, I've been out of the office this week on jury duty. And the week prior to that, I was in uh, Myrtle Beach. But uh, please feel free to give me a call. And I appreciate, again, Mayor, uh, the invitation. And thanks so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the vote that you have brought us and as he said, we will follow and ask him questions, perhaps during the time of our lunch. But I guess I would say this, I'm sorry that today is June 15th. But anyway, <laughs> I didn't plan it. we hope 1992 will be on time <laughs> on June 15th. Design. Thank you. And we do have with us today the presence of Ms. Carol Carolyn Crawford. Ms. Crawford is our Deputy Director of the National Conference of Black Mayors. <laughs> Maybe some of our mayors here today have the first opportunity to meet Ms. Crawford. And um, those of you that have been working diligently with the Black National Black Mayors Conference and have been attending annual meetings as such that I know you are more familiar. But today, we're pleased to have Ms. Crawford with us and we're going to allow her to speak to us as she's going to make a presentation. Ms. To be with the mayors again. In South Carolina. First of all, let me bring you greetings on behalf of our national president, Mayor Unita Blackwell, uh, to the group uh, and to say that she bids you Godspeed and wishes you much success and so forth and offers her services, uh, especially the services of the national staff where we can be of service to you. And also on behalf of our executive director, Michelle Faruma, who could not be with us today. Let me say thanks to the mayors for their support in um, attending and helping us to go to meet with the Legislative Black Caucus and we will be following that up and there is some follow up underway now. So uh, we think we have started something. The project I'm here to talk to you about today, I mentioned to the mayors at that 
after that meeting that there was a possibility that we would get some funds, our grant would be refunded to do some programs, and one of the programs for us would be if the chapter accepts it with the state of South Carolina. <coughs> We have been funded by the U.S. Um, Department of Labor from the Employment and Training Administration to continue our efforts and work with the Job Training Partnership Act program related to employment and training. One component under that program, uh, we had run two years ago two career expos in the state that were pro pilot projects in the state of Alabama and the state of Mississippi. And I brought along some sample programs so you can take a look at the way those programs were run. And sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. I also brought along a little agenda um, for us to, to just talk briefly about the purpose, as I say, one component of that program would be to run one youth career expo program. And when we are preparing our proposals, we look to state chapters that have strength to help us carry these out. Since we've done pilot projects, we're now ready to run the full-blown project, we hope, in the state of South Carolina. And what it is, it's a as one component of the program. I have to say one component because this is only one piece of the action. Uh, we have some others that will be doing workshops in some other states, but this is a focus on youth. And let me say up front that the program we're looking at, uh, hoping that the chapter will adopt and buy in with us, is to implement a one-day career exposition program that's aimed to increase the career awareness of you 14 to 19 years old in small and medium uh, sized communities with high population, uh, high unemployment rates. The program, we know the resources of our black colleges and universities. And so our aim is to link this program as we did in the other two states to one of our black colleges and universities in the state of South Carolina. It's a one day program and so it would be run on a weekend more than likely because it, the kids would be in school. The other two we ran during the summer and we were able to bring the students in overnight, uh, do some things with them the day before and then run an all day Saturday program and, and let them go home. And the mayors were involved as well. But we're looking and we'll have to t take a look at some possible dates that may fit into the mayor's calendar and also the university's calendar. The program is, would be offered so that you would have an opportunity to select or let volunteer, or however the mayors decide to do this. X number of students, 10 to 15 students, we would like to bring more, but I don't know that our funds are going to permit us to travel more, than, more students than that, um, to a central place, to one of the um, campuses of the black colleges or universities in South Carolina, with the hope of bringing in people from various types of careers, kind of as role models. Hopefully we can get some persons also from your community to come in and because it's good for students to see them. We're not trying to duplicate what's going on in the high schools. I mean in, in the school system because we know we can't. But we feel that the mayors have to take some leadership role in helping kids <coughs> to really develop as leaders and also really begin to look beyond that high school education. So that's the focus of the program. So I'll stop right here for a minute and answer any questions, quick questions that you may have. And then if not, we can just briefly look down. And you don't have to agree on these things today, but these are some things that we have to move <coughs> and take a, begin to take a look at because it takes some planning time to pull it together and to pull the kinds of resource persons together. We will be working um, with the National Alliance of Business to help us pull this program out. 
and most of you know Sonny Walker and his staff, Charles Roberts, Mayor Delaney Harris. They worked with us on the other two projects and we'll have a uh, small subcontractor work with us on this project as well so that we can also pull from some national resources. The program does not have to be structured like we see it here. But let me tell you some of our immediate needs if the chapter agrees to go with us on this project. is a need to have a small mayoral committee to begin to help us <coughs> to give some structure to this program. Um, we need three to five mayors who really want to give some time and have some contacts and some resources to begin to plan it and pull it together. The next thing we need to do is to make a decision as to which college or university you would like to try to link the program with so we can begin those contacts at the administrative <coughs> level and uh, so forth. We have worked with a couple of colleges here, and I, I just list two. There may be some others that you want to throw in the hat, but that's why we bring it to the chapter to let them uh, make the decision because we know that you have working relationships with colleges and universities. But I put these here, two here, because these are two that we have already worked with in some other programs, some former programs we've had. And then we need to look also at a potential date for a career expo. We know a lot of this is going to depend <coughs> upon your chapter schedule as well as space and availability at a college and university. The reason we want to house it at a black college is because we want this to, we want co black colleges to feel a strong allegiance to our mayors and let our mayors know that this is a resource base that we need to be using. We recognize that college, black colleges and universities are struggling for funds too. Everybody is, but they, they have some uh, facility available as well as some human resources that they can be lending expertise to our, our citizen towns and also to our youth. And the next thing is we want some parental involvement in the program as well because we feel that the parent, we need to be talking with parents as well and they don't need to be left out of the circle if we're really going to begin to get back to this strong black family unit that we keep talking, that we have had and somehow we've strayed away from it. And then the final thing, and you wouldn't do the resolution today, but we would need a resolution from the chapter indicating that you are willing to participate. So with that, I will uh, leave it open and I'll be here and we can come back down for some pl other planning sessions as well. But I just put this plan in session number one. I guess I'm being presumptuous. Okay. Do you have any questions? We, we will be able to provide the financial assistance that's needed for travel for the students, the youth to get them there if you have to um, rent a bus. Maybe there are some towns that are located close by like Ridgeville and Lincolnville that, you know, in some cases we may be able to bring more than 10 students. It just depends upon whether we can get vans to transport students from a region or what have you. So we can began to be creative and also we are looking for corporate and business, small and minority business involvement in this as well. Because we feel they have some things to offer as well. And let me just briefly give you uh, a little information. We say 14 to 19 years old. In Mississippi, we had a parent who had brought her daughter and son who were the high school ladies. And this little seven year, and so she had to bring along her little seven year old because she didn't have anybody to stay, anyone to stay with. This little seven year old probably got more out of the program than some of the others. At the end of the program, she could tell us what she wanted to be <coughs> and how she arrived at that decision. And she stood before the, the group of uh, teenagers and told them what she wanted to be. And she had gone to one of the at one of the set settings, we had some colleges from Mississippi and, and technical schools to come in and make presentations. So she had gone around to these and she could tell them what college she wanted to go to. So, you know, we say that to say, we looked at the program and said, well, maybe we need to be doing this for uh, younger kids as well, because that's actually where it needs to start is down in the elementary grades. 
Are you ready for questions or comments to Carol? And I'll be around too, so I won't take up your whole meeting, but you know, as soon as we could get a commitment from you and to know, uh, you know. How soon did you need um, with the organization? <laughs> Excuse me, Mayor Field. In the form of a comment, first, Carolyn, thank you. And I don't know how many of you as mayors have been involved, but I will say this. From the workshop that we had in Atlanta, talking about, um, and that was back in January, was, was it? Right, January. January. Um, I really came back to Ridgeville, and I was certainly interested in trying to find out what we could do. And um, this is, is something I call serious that we need to think about our young children. Well, when I say our, I mean everybody's children, not just our family of children, because they need to be exposed to this. And I don't know about your school systems and districts, and I'm not carrying mine down, but I'm going to say with our um, black children, they're missing out on a lot. And I've experienced getting an appointment and going into job service in our area. And I just want to tell you this, I don't know whether any of you tried it, but I tried it because of the <coughs> workshop that I attended. And I finally got an appointment after saying I was going to go to, to the state. The gentleman said he didn't have time to really schedule me until after the summer. But there were some children that I knew in Ridgeville, or after June at least, some children in Ridgeville that I knew really needed to be in some type of even the work program because they were coming from a low to moderate income family who I knew that they qualified for some type of jobs to hear about some kind of programs that could probably help them in enhancing their um, you know, learning capabilities. And so I went down <coughs> and met with the gentleman on Tuesday and as a result, two students that I knew, I know many more, but there were two that I got them to commit to see and I was pleased this this week to know that one of the young ladies will be going to an orientation session on Monday. And another young lady who was sort of like the deadline here today, almost, and Cheryl can attest to it because she was with me when I received a phone call and uh, from one of the um, uh, uh, teachers in Somerville who after talking to job services, this lady called a black gentleman in Somerville on behalf of one of the students who had graduated from our high school. And this young lady will be going up to Dutton Hall, and I think it's Clapham, Dutton is on Clapham's campus, to something that I wasn't aware of, was some type of college credit program where this young lady will enter and receiving 12 hours of credit and some uh, no supplement of $300. I didn't know anything about that program. And I feel from hearing what I did in Atlanta and deciding that I was going to go to job service and find out from these people, what are you doing and, and, and what is your role in trying to help some of the students? And at first it was like, wasn't too much that they could do. And they were sending me somewhere else. But I decided, look, I'm going in. So if you can't help me, I'll go to someone at the state, you know, above you. And then they realized that they could see me at 10 o'clock Tuesday morning, mm -hmm. and I went down. So I'm saying I am working real hard, and I'm going to our guidance counselor and our school system, when school opens again or even before then, to find out what are they doing and trying to steer our young people in the right direction that are viable programs to get these children into. And those families that are able to send their kids to college Maybe, you know, it will bother them or the families who they know they can get private jobs. But we have children out here who have needs too. And that they are fearful. I don't know whether you work with any of those people that are fearful. And they're even afraid because they're on welfare. I've had the experience of them saying, man, well, we want to get a job. But my mother say, if we do, we're afraid the welfare is going to be cut off. I'm trying to say to them, we don't want you to continue to stay on welfare. And as I said to one young lady, when we divided four weeks into what her welfare check was, $41.25 a week. Who can live off of $41.25? We are going to have to help our, our black families and work hard, and I know we have. 
somebody else want to do a Miss C. Cheryl after you, you had something you want to ask her. If not, we're going to proceed with our program. And we'll think, well, I'll give you a little time to think about whether or not to, today you would like to say, Mayors, you need time to think whether you want to proceed with such a program. If so, maybe we can have a little powwow and a little break together and decide whether or not we want to go forward with this program. I'm not going to ask you to say yes, no, whatever at the moment. Think a little and we'll talk about it. And I think we could say one. Oh, I thought she was saying something. I beg your pardon. Mayor Beauty, you want to I share with us? Um, <laughs> I was just thinking of, um, you know, why I asked about the time was to find out, you know, uh, specifically, mm -hmm. you know, when and if we should make a decision on this today or not. Our hearing shall also be sooner the better. I'll give you some time to think. And hopefully, you know, before we leave here, we can. I know, but I'm not yes, satisfied please. with the sooner the better. I'm wanting her to say, you know, like when do we have to have it? Because I don't okay. I just she don't want to do I need one in a day. In other <laughs> words, when you came, Ms. Crawford, maybe we ask this, mm -hmm. you came hoping that we could perhaps commit ourselves to getting to work with this. Exactly. That's what exactly. We yeah. Yeah. So and, exactly. Um, if in that case, um, you know, based on some of the other things that we have been involved with, with the National Conference, even though we don't have a quorum, um, I would move that we go forward with this. I would say we can. Alternatively. Yes, what I mean. The quorum. And, and, you know, we well, don't have all. I say it. You know, this is, um, and that's providing, I put it in there, providing the people in here, mostly we are the ones that attend the meeting, um, the meetings even with the South County. Well, working with this career expo for youth, as by saying I, I pose his name, I have a disorder, and we're going to drive and go forward. Thank you. Good. And we are going to move back up the agenda now and uh, reach one of our next important things that we want to say. Carolyn, as I forget, I want to say thank you for the presentation. Yeah, please do that. Thanks to the coordinator, Cheryl. Thank you. Good. <laughs> and we have our conference report, our conference coordinator's report. Ms. Hampton, Ms. Hampton has been working very diligently with the mayors here to try to help keep us together and to... You won't have to leave us, will you? No, ma'am. I just wanted to make sure I didn't get to give them a show. <coughs> Sorry for the... Thank you, Mayor. Let me say good morning to everyone I had had a chance to speak with. It's good to see so many of you out. and. To the mayor and the town officials, we certainly have felt welcome. I think this has been one of our, our nice ones, and we certainly thank you for having us and all of your hospitality. Um, there are several things on my agenda that we needed to talk about today, but I guess the first thing I'll try to follow up where uh, Cleve left off for the mayors that have packets, and I think for some of the people we received, um, I put in your packet just uh, every time I get information about any kinds of monies that are available for our towns and things, and I try to put it in. And one program that's coming through the Federal Home Loan Bank uh, is an affordable housing, and I put a, a very brief summary in the um, packet for the mayors. And this is where a unit of local government, your town or your county, can work with a bank in your town and apply for these funds. Now, the next round of funding is October 15th. It is for a housing program. They have two kinds of funding. They have one where a bank will set aside a group of low interest loans and you have to go in and negotiate with your banker in what kind of interest rates and that kind of thing um, for people to either construct, to rehab, or whatever. The second um, phase that they have is a direct subsidy. I don't know how many of the direct subsidies they're gonna fund. And that means they give monies for down payment assistance or can provide monies for down payment assistance. So you really need to talk to your bankers and if they're having people that are coming in that may qualify for FHA or VA financing but they are lacking some of their down payments 
And I think federal regs are going to change, so that down payment that they have to pay for FHA and VA is going to go up. They used to pay, uh, you know, used to could get in a house for a regular fifty, sixty thousand dollar house for under FHA and VA for about seventeen hundred dollars. Now it's moved up to three percent, and that's about three thousand dollars of whatever their down payment is. So the down payment amount is increasing. But they, this, this, um, you can call Atlanta for an application, and I have some copies. Uh, but it is a good program that you can sit down and work out some of your housing problems and you can get your local banker involved. They are supposed to work with you because they have to um, respond to the federal government. They are making banks comply with what they call CRA now. So they have to and they are looking for projects out there to do more than just maybe give t-shirts. So go in and talk to your local banker about some of those things and this is just one um, little information I had put in your packet. The other things that I'm aware of, and Cleve talked about a number of grants. I don't know how many of you got some letters from the South Carolina Forestry Commission or about planting trees. Uh, so the deadline for that is, it looks like a good program. You do have a match, but the, um, the, the deadline for that is July 15th. So I wanted to let some of you know about that and kind of remind you of that. The next thing was, they, it came out back in April or May and it's from FEMA, it's the Mitigation Grant Project, and you can undertake um, for people who had severe flooding or whatever kind of damage during Hurricane Hugo or from the last flood that we got sometime early in March. FEMA has come out through our state with some funds that are available. Now this is a 50-50 match, and I'm checking with them to see if you can put other federal dollars with it. Uh, for those who don't have any drainage systems or those kind of things, it would be a good program to do that. What you need to find out, because what you can do for your portion of the match, if they will allow federal funds as match, you might could use the Livable Communities Program that uh, Cleveland talked about to match with this. For instance, to like the town I'm working with, Turbeville, our drainage would be about $180,000. So this grant could give 90. The town has got to come up with 90,000 of their own. So some of that, you know, could be cash and in-kind and force account. But we are looking at the possibility of trying to use the community livable project to see if we could get some of that funds. If they will allow federal dollars to match this federal program, then maybe you could do that. So for some of the towns that are having problems with drainage and other things, that when you have severe weather, it creates a problem for your citizens, this may be one of the things to look at. This also is due, I think, July 15th or the 25th or somewhere in there. But um, you know you need to write in and talk with them. And uh, the gentleman's name to talk with at the state is uh, Franz Cotes, and his number is seven three four zero four two eight. And that's the FEMA grants that they're coming up with. Okay, so that's just some grant information that I wanted to tell you about that's available. Um, the second thing on my list are two things that I think we need to do. Um, one, I wanted to inform the group, and I don't know how many of you know the young man, but he has really worked hard with the South Carolina Conference of Black Mayors. Chris Lindsay, who's with SCNG, his daughter was um, killed, his 15-year-old daughter was killed in an auto accident, and they buried her, I think, on Thursday. Uh, I would like our conference to do something, even if it's after the fact, because SCNG has always come through with us. Chris is a fine person. Um, so I think we like to do a, you know, a gift and, and keep it in the $35 to $50 range and maybe a card and some flowers to be sent or, or something they could place on the grave, whether it's a pot plant or not. But I would ask, um, Mayor, if you could give me, someone would give a motion from the floor that we could proceed with that expenditure. I so move. Second. It's been probably moved and second that we respond to the call from Cheryl. Uh, are you ready for the question? Question, question. Oh, um, that's what I say, right? Aye. Uh, Yes, and he, by he, virtue he, of just the man. Right, he's a very fine stuff. person. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm yes. sure they would love to hear from him and his wife would love to hear from, from some of you. So I think a call would also be sufficient because that has taken them. They, her and her brother, her brother was driving. They were on the way, I think, looking for a job or whatever. But they were out in the morning. They had applied, I think, down to the Urban League for a job, for a summer job. And he turned in front of a car. And he got some minor scrapes and scratches. And I understand she got a broken neck. So she died an hour or so later at the hospital. So it's very sad. We very want to pray for them. So we'll try to get an appropriate card and plan, even in after the fact. But we wanted to let them know that we thought about it. And I thought that was good for my conference. The second thing is, 
for the um, when we had our legislative reception in Columbia, there were about five firms, I think, that gave um, nice monies to us that we could put on our thing. We have done, we have talked back with them by phone. We have not sent them a letter yet, and I was waiting to ask this. The PRT has some nice little small gifts that are South Carolina souvenirs that, that do not cost that much that I think we should at least send them or a post of South Carolina because these are larger corporations and they gave $500 or better to our, um, to our uh, affair, right, to our reception. And these are people who give continuously large donations to us. SCNG is one of them in that fact. And I thought it would be nice if we just um, purchase, I think there are about five of these companies and they give um, a nice little small South Carolina souvenir to us. Um, and we will keep it, you know, within a reasonable amount, not anything large, or maybe one of the new print posters they have of South Carolina, because they have some nice ones that they can put in their office. And I'm going to ask uh, permission to do that. There's no. Well, um, I so move, but you know, we're saying you need not a motion, but um, I think we may need to make a determination here to let the president then. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Do coming things back. like that, you right. know, up to a certain amount. I'm coming back with a motion, just yeah. some changes from my bylaws but to I, ask I the group. Yeah, I don't have any problems with it. I don't have any problems. Do you know her problems? No problem. No problem. No problem. I, I, I so agree because they have been good to us and we want to keep that working relationship. So we're going to grant you the uh, permission to do that, Cheryl. And again, we are going to talk about what the president will have the authority to do to a certain point. <laughs> you all do. But, Sorry, you know, but and you know, you know just right. with, like Chris, I mean, we would like to know. I didn't know. We didn't find out yeah. until I Thursday the day yeah. of the funeral. And so that's why, I yeah, and I, that just really struck me. So I thought the two would be good, to, um, you know, to find out to say something, but right. just be able to do it. But then still, we would need to know. Right. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are two things that we'll do. Um, the, we have two other items that I think are important to us, and I guess I better have an annual conference first, and then we'll come back to a review of our bylaws. Uh, in your package, you should also, for the mayors, have a copy of this little memo to us. And our annual conference is coming up. Um, we've kind of changed our dates somewhat. I will, no, no, one monkey doesn't stop the show, so if you all want to move it back, I'll plan it, but I can't be there. Normally, traditionally, our meeting is the 19th, well, the third, that third um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in the month of September. I have asked that we even need to do it one week earlier, which would be that second weekend, the 12th through the 14th, or we back it up to that 4th. Does anybody have a calendar? I think that's the 26th, 25th and 26th of September. But I'm trying to keep in mind, this year we, we said that we would host it in Denmark, South Carolina. And Dr. White is, also works at State College. And around that time in our area, given the kinds of functions that I'm going to talk about or proposing at the conference so agrees for us to have. Did somebody, what's that? I have a calendar. What's that? That's four, four. That four, four Thursday and Friday. Okay. It's a calendar for um, the year 2000. We right were recommending, <laughs> we were recommending the second weekend. We were recommending the second weekend <coughs> instead of the fourth because I think there's a football classic coming up in Atlanta. Um, and, and a lot of the people from the area, and you see why I'm saying that because we're proposing some evening functions that would draw the general public. So um, I think um, we, I'm recommending that we do it the 12th through the 14th. We may have to change once we finish planning. That that sure, you were saying 12 to the 14th. Uh -huh. well, then you would need to do the 26 through the 28. Uh huh. But I'm saying that because on that that Friday evening, what I'm trying to propose are two evening functions, and one is changing our Charles Ross leadership banquet. I mean luncheon to a banquet, and that way we 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 have contacted several speakers across the board. One is um, the mayor of D.C. Sharon Pratt Dixon. Um, we've contacted um, Governor Wilder. What we're trying to do is we have relied very heavily on outside contributions and our general public does not get involved. So I'm asking two things, two things this year. Good, thank you. This is our new recently elected mayor to the town of Andrews, Mayor Anderson. So we're 
Middle of my sentence, but since he's just walked in, Madam Chair, it might be good if we introduce our other mayors to him, and I'll break here and let you do that, so then we can kind of get him back up to where we are, since we're delighted to have him and his guests. So, if you told us, I apologize for being late. I had sickness in Florence. My brother's terminally ill in Florence, and I'm, I'm late. And I tried to call, and I said I'd go anyway. You know, best to be late than never. This is a, a good experience for me. I'm from Andrews, South Carolina. I've been residing in Andrews for the past 12 years. Uh, my home is Lake City, Florence County, and uh, I've been back in this in South Carolina since the year 1969. And uh, my family and I live in Andrews, and I run a little business in Andrews, and I work in Andrews. I'm glad to be here with you. And your name again? Love it, Anderson Senior. Thank you, sir. Nice to have you with us. And we're going to begin from uh, our mayor. We'll begin and come around. Oh, please. Put your name on there. Four of them. Come on. Come on in. We have all kinds of guests. I tell you. I'm special. I'm Zelda Fielding, and I'm the mayor of Lincolnville, South Carolina. I'm John Carter, and I'm the mayor of Great Oaks, South Carolina. That's in Lawrence County, Florida. I'm Zalas, I'm Zalas, Council of Lawrence County. I'm Franklin B. Goodman, Jr., the mayor of San Quentin, South Carolina. I like that. I'm Peter Parsons Starks, the mayor of Richmond, South Carolina. And for another year, you must be a person of the South Carolina. <laughs> 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 and I'm Linda Lindsay 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 Thank you so much, and again, it is a pleasure to have you come in, and we'll be praying for you, sir. Thank you. And uh, it's good to see uh, Mr. Seabrook with us today. And we do have a potion for recognition of guests, and certainly our other guests that are present with us will have an opportunity to have you say who you are and where you're from, too. Cheryl, thank you. May proceed. On a, a, our quarterly <laughs> meetings, but on the one in September, we call our annual conference, and instead of doing just the meeting on Saturday, we do a series of banquets and workshops starting on Thursday and concluding on Saturday with our mayor's prayer breakfast and then our business session. So I was just in the uh, progress of ton, and we've been trying to make some changes, and that we weighed heavily on uh, outside contributions. This year, I'm asking the mayors to work with me as I think our program booklet, we can increase that and do better. We're asking each mayor to do five ads in our program booklet this year. The dates we were talking about, what I proposed, was September 12th through the 14th. We'd also looked at that fourth weekend, which is the 20, 26th through the 28th. But we have to understand we're in football season, and we were talking about having two evening functions, changing our Charles Ross Leadership Bank uh, a war, a luncheon to an evening affair that Friday evening at 7.30 and trying to get us a good speaker that we could sell tickets to the general public at about $15 a person. Um, we had contacted the mayor of D.C., the Honorable Sharon Pratt Dixon. We had contacted Governor Wilder. Um, we had looked at Merle Evers. We looked at several people, and, and some of them are pretty good. We're holding our costs down just what we did for the mayor's prayer breakfast last year. The expense would be no more than just to get them here, and if they spend the night, they're lodging. I'm talking with the mayor of D.C. That looks very favorable. Um, she says she does not charge to come, so I think it's no more than fair that we do what we did for the gentleman last year, and that's to get her here, um, and then that would be a, a savings cost to us. The other thing is we normally start on Thursdays, and I need to ask the group 
you know, because our attendance is very low on Thursday, I had proposed an evening function for Thursday evening. That may or may not be conducive that we can do. I have looked at trying to have out of Charleston what we call CATS, the Charleston Actors Theater. And maybe we come in at 6, do a meeting at 6 to, uh, or 6.30 to 7.30 or, or a gathering, and then go into our evening function. That way we would also sell tickets. That would be one promotion of the arts, of the black arts from the South Carolina Conference of Black Mayors. We have a tremendous number of performers out there. This is a very good group. I got to see them in Charleston for Spoleto. They have been invited over to Europe and will be going there. Um, the young men and women perform very well. We don't know if we'll be able to work with them. We're trying to work that cost out because if we were going to do that, I wanted to try to hold ticket sales to $10. We may have to go with the, uh, an excerpt from the Henderson and Davis players and try to do something like that if the group's so involved. I don't know. You may not want to come in on Thursday because we have, you know, very little atten you know, it's, it's kind of low attendance. So I don't know, and I want some direction from the, from, from the conference body. Would you like to try to have two evening functions? Do you approve evening functions? You know, that kind of thing. We see the cost of our ads here that you have in your packet. They're the same as they were last year. Um, the front inside cover is $300. A full page is $200. A half page is $100, and a quarter page is $50. The rear outside cover is $300. Um, so we ask, again, we ask each mayor, we're trying to fill our program booklet. In 1989, Hurricane Hugo hit, and we had planned, I think, a real good conference. Our program booklet, almost double and a half, paid for itself because we had good participation. So I'm asking if we could increase that and, and do a good on our ticket sales if you approve the evening function. Um, for our speaker and our awards banquet. And we're asking this year, normally we give the awards to a mayor. I'm asking that maybe we could take nominations from across the state and each person in their town do that. That pulls people in and gives us some output, you know, in the areas. It may be education, it may be government, it may be civic, whatever. And look to, to look for that leadership and give that award. We may we may give two or three little small plaques or trophies or whatever from people across the state. So you may want to bring nominations from your town, from each one of the member towns or whatever, and have people nominate. We can do a general thing to civic organizations saying we are asking. That increases people's awareness of what we're about and what we're trying to do, and and and, and gives us some publicity as well if we kind of broaden out like that. So I'd like to hear some some comments or some questions or what y'all would like to change or whatever. I don't know if we're going to be able to work the evening function out for Thursday evening. I'm trying to do that, but it may not be feasible that we do that at this time. But I would certainly like to hear your suggestions and comments, Mayor. We usually have registration start 12 or 1. Yeah, you're about 2 somewhere. 2 or something. It's like 4 and 5 before you get there, maybe 6 or 7. And I think we need to start to make a point of trying to be there on time. So maybe we need to do as Cheryl says, set a time. And that designated time, we don't make a point of trying to be there. Excuse me. Right. Have you finished in the area of our conference? I think we have for now. I think what we'll do is try to get out some memorandums to everybody. If, like I said, if our dates have to change <coughs> as the confirmation of the speaker and, that, and, the, and the other program that we'll try to do, we'll do that. And then maybe by mid-July, we would have had a full agenda to your tentative agenda um, <coughs> for you all to look at and, and, and have suggestions. But if you have any suggestions or whatever, please um, please give me a call and let me know that. And um, we'll get something out to you about the nominations for our Charles Ross <coughs> Leadership Awards and try to do that. So you'll be getting more information by mid-July. We should have that because we have to turn it out. We're looking for something that early in September. Then we need to start now trying to get out our mailings and everything to everybody. No, your limitation now, right? Well, you've already agreed to pay what we're going to pay. Uh, this uh, that Chris and with the. Oh, yeah, I mean um, that. I'm just so talking that will be another. taken care of. So before we have any other matters to be taken care of, I think that meeting will be called shortly after, you know, this quarter meeting. I don't mean today when I say shortly, but we will be getting into the meeting, you know, about the next four to six weeks. We'll, we'll settle this before we start to pay any other people. Mm -hmm. we'll okay. I think that would be very big. Yes. Let me see your watch because I don't have to. Support me with the business. May I ask this? What time is our lunch, um, Mr. Mayor? I'm sure we're going to have a business meeting. 
Oh, I didn't know whether they had to sit, sit down and we want to kind of talk down, down for the meetings. We don't want your folks to be reading. Thank you, Cheryl, for all the reports and everything you've given, and we will act on the owners. I'd just like to say very briefly, when you look in your minutes, you will see that the $500 was for the Tom Moss's um, affair that they were having. And I'd like for the conference to know that I called the members of our executive board and did a, it was a polling to ask because we had made, in your minutes, you will see $2,000 was asked for. Knowing that it, we couldn't pay $2,000, it was agreed upon that we were going to give, was it 1000 And we could not meet that. And I want to say to you, uh, after talking to the members of our executive vote by polling, the decision was made that $500 was given. And this is one of the reasons that we want to get everything satisfied within our bylaws and our really good sense of direction that when these kind of things come up, we can intelligently address them and make sure that we are in keeping And with I our do hope that we will include in there for things such as that as a request that then we will have to have a quorum in order to make a decision. Not the, not the president. Yes. Yeah, no, something right. like that. No, no, that. I never. We have that. We have it. It should come before the president. Any money given yes. should come before the president before her meeting right. as well. Right. And she should be notified at least a day in advance because I think there was no notification of that. And if there are things that are not on the agenda that you wish to talk about before we get into our sessions, I would appreciate it if you would bring that forth to me and not spring something on us because sometimes you aren't really thinking at the moment when a person brings something in and you may act and then you realize that wasn't something that we should have done. So that's the only time I'm going to accept is that you come first and forth with it. If not, I'm going to say this cannot be brought up until a later date. So please keep that in mind. <laughs> Do you have a time limit? Say if I want something, I mean, Joan Doe wants something on the agenda. I think it should be a time limit prior to the meeting. Yes. In case if you have to find some information about whatever. Treasurer, since you're sitting here, it says thank you. Okay. It says thank you. I know I can never repay you for the kindness, so I'm asking God to thank you for remembering us during our bereavement from the Parsons Stocks family, Ridgeville, South Carolina. Yes, well, it was in the death of the Nathan's family, but I said Parsons Stocks, thank you, because the reason you really rendered was because it was my family member, and it was like the second mother of mine, and thanks a lot for the plural that was said, and I didn't get an opportunity to say thank you to you. And I want to say it today, we certainly thank you very much. For I took it upon myself to send it when I found out. <laughs> and, then, That's all right. and, um, and she attended, and Mayor Fielding made the wake, and Cheryl made the funeral. And we thank you so much. You would find a hit Oh, no. Yes, you <laughs> are. And I tell you, you just took the back of it.
okay, and what kind of impact and effect that's going to have on uh, leadership in this country. Uh, another is the unemployment situation across this country that are facing our communities. Um, another has to be education. Another is crime. And when I look at crime, we need to really look at black on black crime that's sweeping this country. What are some of the things that the National Council of Black Mayors are doing in terms of addressing the, um, um, the crime uh, situation in this country? Have they got program, policy, a project that can deal directly with the uh, uh, crime uh, situation? In, in well, at this point, we don't have a program established. The board, I'm sure, is it's one of the issues that the board is going to continuously look at and see what kind of programs, et cetera, um, as a body we can come up with to try to move to our communities to begin to improve the situation. Um, just off the record, I think one of the things that we've got to do as we look at the crime issue is to really begin to look at what's happening to teenagers, especially black teens in this country, as they get more and more involved in gangs, as they have more time on their hands, not that they have a lot of free time. Um, I think this is where we've got to focus a lot of attention, is beginning with trying to clean up some of the kinds of uh, problems that are confronting our teens because too many of our teens are involved in crime today. I know I've seen uh, uh, recently we had a, a, a national conference uh, on the black family uh, in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. We had some of the uh, noted national uh, figures come into uh, uh, South Carolina and talk about the black family. Um, is this one of the emphasis the uh, national conference going to going to uh, have in the next few years? The I'm sure it is. Um, we've got to move back to. Um, really focusing on the, the uh, family unit. I think uh, when we reflect on our days of growing up, we know that at that point, the thing that really kept m most of us going was the family unit and the extended family. And when we begin to talk to people today about what's going on in families, the first thing they want to say is, oh, that's because the mother and the daddy is working. And when we say, oh, no, our mothers and fathers work too. Um, but you always had either that neighbor or that aunt or that grandmother that would um, take charge in the uh, head of the family's absence. And I think we've got to go back to that, where if I see a child out of line, I can correct that child, whether it's, it's a member of my family or whether it's a neighbor. Uh, I think we've lost that, and that's hurting us as a fam as a black family unit. Don't you agree that the uh, the impact on the black family is more complex than you know, like some of the simplistic views of what the you know what the uh, problem of the uh, black family? I know we're talking about the extended family, but it seems like there's an erosion of values and things of that, that nature. How do we address those? I know the school system at one time, although we were a segregated school system, but we taught those values in the uh, school system and not, not only the school system at home and in the, in the church. Uh, how do you address that now in the movement? In this country, that values should not be taught in the, uh, the public school system. And I think that's where we're missing the boat, Mayor. Um, and here again, we've got to go back to some of these uh, community kinds of meetings that, where we talk about value system. We've got to also do more of it in the homes. We've got to get the church has to become more of a leader. It used to be a leader with a lot of things going on, and I think we've really got to get back to the black church beginning again to anchor some of the uh, programs and talk about some of the kinds of problems that we have and open their doors not just on a Sunday and on a Wednesday night but keep them open so that they reach out and do more in education as well. We can't leave it to the schools any longer.
Um, I know in, in my day coming up, the, the black church had a tremendous uh, role in, in shaping um, in not only the, you know, the black family, the black individual. Uh, in light of some of the, uh, I guess, the, the erosion of the influence of the black church, uh, and in light of the fact that the church in general is, the, is still the most segregated institution in the United States, uh, do you see this as when the young blacks see the church and they see that the church is not relevant to their, you know, their life now? Would that be a factor in the, in the, the lesson of the influence of the black church? I think it could be a, a factor. I think one of the uh, one of the sad days was when we legislated prayer out of the school system. I think we we legislated a lot out as it relates to the whole overall uh, moral character in this country. And I'm not saying that the school has to take this responsibility, but I think you can legislate so far, and when you legislate certain things, perhaps that child would be touched in a school, may not necessarily be reached in that home. What about in terms of uh, African American going into the teaching uh, profession? I know in our uh, school system in Allendale, and I guess throughout the state and the, and the nation, that uh, African American percentage wise are not in the classroom, and when you got a majority of the classroom are African American, and they don't see uh, the role model and the teacher there that relate to their cultural experience. I agree with you, Mayor, that uh, we need to encourage more blacks to look at a career in education, especially in um, preschool education, elementary education, as well as high school education, to say nothing about uh, colleges and universities. And one of the uh, areas we really need to encourage some blacks to get into, especially the, is to have more black males get into education so that our youth who may not have a male role model in the home can at least go to that school and begin to identify with a black male as a role model. You indicated in our conference uh, this morning about the career day opportunity, uh, career day right. workshop. Uh, could you give us some, uh, some, some an overview of what that project is about? Could we use that project and address some of the areas that we just talked about? Well, the um, program, while it will have a focus on careers and to encourage our students to look at uh, preparation, post-secondary uh, preparation, not just going to a college or a university, but it may be just a training program that we need to encourage them to get into. Everyone shouldn't go to college, uh, but we should encourage them to go and develop their minds beyond the uh, post-secondary level. And we need to step back a minute and say we need to encourage those who are even leaning in the direction of thinking about dropping out of school to stay in school uh, and to, you know, get trained. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. I enjoyed the conversation. May God bless you. <laughs>